get started. Amen. 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 So I just want to uh, welcome everybody. It's so wonderful to see everybody. We'll go ahead and get started. And then as, as uh, in the order of the program, I think all of you saw in our group chat, uh, we'll have the Evangelista kids, Nate and Hart, leading our scripture, our prayer, and our worship this morning. Amen. There it is on the chat room. Thank you. Yeah, Cello put the lyrics in our chat. If you need to have the lyrics, they're in there. And I hope all of you uh, have prepared for the Lord's Supper today. Today is Lord's Supper Sunday, so I hope whatever bread or crackers or, uh, and, or, and or wine that you have, I hope that we are ready and prepared for that. Um, I just want to share with us a, a thought this morning. You know, I like to open up with a thought. And, and here's the thought. And again, I like to, to, to read and meditate, but here's a thought from a, a theologian, and I don't normally do this every week, but this one is the same theologian as last week, J.I. Packer, and this is what he said about God sculpting us. He said, God uses chronic pain and weakness along with other afflictions as his chisel for sculpting our lives. Felt weakness deepens dependence on Christ for strength every day. Amen, everybody? Amen. The weaker we feel, the harder we lean. And the harder we lean, the stronger we grow spiritually, even if our bodies waste away. And then he says this, to live with your thorn, and we all have a thorn. Amen, church? To live with your thorn uncomplainingly, that is, sweet, patient, and free in heart to love and help others, even though every day you feel weak, is true sanctification. It is true healing for the spirit, and it is supreme victory of grace. Amen? The grace of God in our lives that helps us get through each and every day. And, and, and thank you, Evangelistas, for choosing the song that you did because it just fitted perfectly for the word I wanted to share this morning. And now, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Nate and Hart. Okay. Hello, church. Uh, good morning. I miss you guys, and I miss being, you know, with you personally and physically. And uh, hopefully we can all get back to the church and praise the Lord. So um, I did choose one scripture from the Bible, and it is 1 Corinthians verse 16, 14. And it's a very short verse, and it says, do everything in love. So it's, it's a short, short sentence, but it means a lot. So, I mean... It, it means what it means. You do everything in love and without being spiteful because that's the way of doing things in life to get better in life and also to make God <laughs> proud of us. And it's a better way of, it's better than spreading germs. So to spread love instead. So now we'll sing Desert Song. Amen. Ready, Hart? Yes. All right. Okay. Feel free to sing along with us, because, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. 
Next song we'll be doing is Good Good Father. <clears throat>
you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Thank you, Hart, and thank you, Nate Evangelista. You're welcome. For ushering in the presence of the Holy Spirit through the worshipful music. Amen, church? Amen. Amen. I'm so glad about one thing with Zoom is that when, when whoever is doing the worship music, I can handily put myself on mute and sing out as loud as I want and not mess anybody up. Amen <laughs> and amen. We do thank God today for his goodness to us. We do thank God today for being the good, good father. And we do thank God today that we are so loved. Amen. And I pray church, I pray everybody who is watching that you may know today that you are so loved by God. Amen. What a blessed assurance, what a blessed thought to know that our good, good Father loves each and every one of us. Amen, church? Amen. 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 So today, church, we come to uh, what I shared last night in Bible study is the last of our sermon series concerning valleys and mountains in the Bible. And perhaps fittingly today, the last mountain that we will look at in, in, some, uh, in some detail, because there's so much that happened on this mountain, it's too much for a 30 minute sermon. And I know y'all don't wanna be here for a half a day conference. Can I get an amen? <laughs> so, so today we're going to see or look at one event in particular that happened on the Mount, what we call Mount Olivet, or what some translation or some people know as the Mount of Olives. And the focus verse today is coming from Matthew 24 to 36. But you know, as is my custom, don't close the page because we'll be turning. Whether you're turning pages or whether you're scrolling on your te technological Bible, don't, don't shut it off, okay? Because we'll be looking at what God's word says about this. And the message today coming from Matthew 24 and 36, this one verse I'm going to read. It says there, however. Now we know whenever we see the word however, there's, that's, that's a, a, a signal for pay attention to these words. It's also a signal that something happened before. And we're gonna talk about that momentarily. But in Matthew 24 and 36, the word of God says this. However, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen, not even the angels, not even the angels in heaven, or the Son himself, only the Father knows. Church, we're going to look at these words of Jesus and what Jesus had to say today in Matthew 24 in a message entitled, I have no idea. May we pray. Heavenly Father, thank you today for this wonderful day. Thank you, God, that you woke us up to see another day this side of heaven. And God, we know that because you did, that God, there is a purpose in our lives for this very day. God, right now, we know that we want to come before you together uh, using the blessings of technology. God, that we're coming together here to worship you in one spirit and of one accord. God, we just pray right now for your wisdom. Open up our ears, open up our minds, open up our hearts. And Lord, I pray today that something may be read, something may be said. Lord, that when we finish this part of our day, that we will be just a little bit different. And God, may we be thankful for all as we pray in the name of your sweet son, Jesus. Amen. I have no idea. Now, Mount Olivet was a place that Jesus was very familiar with. As a matter of fact, there's some things that occurred uh, in the valleys near Mount Olivet, and we heard a wonderful message about the Kidron Valley from Pastor Marvin. 
So if you recall, there are many things that happened at Mount Olivet. I'm just going to tell you that there were a few of them that were really integral in the life of Jesus, in particular, in the last week of his life. There were a, a number of messianic prophecies we know from a study done that were made on the Mount of Olives during Jesus's last week. And Jesus, it began that week with Jesus's triumphal entry. We're not gonna read through all of those scriptures, but I just wanna mention them to you as notes of the importance of the Mount of Olives or Mount Olivet, and in particular to Jesus's last week of his earthly ministry. On the triumphal entry, Jesus presented himself to Israel as the Messiah when he rode into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. That happened there at the Mount of Olives. A second thing that occurred on Mount Olivet was something we're gonna look at in some, in some part today, and that is the Olivet Discourse. Many of you are familiar with the Olivet Discourse, even if you were not familiar that that is what we call it. Amen, church? But after leaving the second temple for the final time and pronouncing judgment against Jerusalem, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives with his disciple and explained prophecies that anticipated his second advent or his second coming. It was on the same Mount of Olives where Jesus was betrayed and Jesus was abandoned. Amen, church? It's on the same Mount of Olives we're gonna look at that a little bit near the end of this message. And, and if, you, if you weren't aware of this church, it was also on this same Mount of Olives where in Acts chapter one, Jesus gave the great commission to his disciples and then he ascended. So this Mount of Olives was also the last place of Jesus's earthly ministry. And lastly, some careful study uh, of the word reveals that the Mount of Olives will also be the place of his, it was the place of his going and it will be the place of his coming. In Zechariah, we know that Jesus in Zechariah 14, we're not gonna go there, but take note for yourself in Zechariah 14, it is written there that Jesus, Zechariah predicted the first coming of the Messiah, amen, who appeared on the Mount of Olives, and, and Zechariah also foresaw the second coming of Christ, quote unquote from scripture, whose feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. So church, it is fitting today that perhaps we look at some portion of some event that happened on the Mount of Olives. Now, we're gonna look today in Matthew 24 in what is known as the Olivet Discourse. Now, I know that the Olivet Discourse contains many things concerning prophecy, concerning what Jesus said about the things of the end times and his second coming. Church, it is impossible. It is impossible to give a careful and thorough explanation, examination of all of those things in this, in this morning sermon. So I'm gonna focus on what Jesus felt was important in this portion of Matthew 24. And, and I made a note to myself at some point, church, that we will talk to, in, some further, in some further explanation to those other things. So take heart. We're just focusing on what we need to focus on today. Amen? If you look at Matthew chapter 24, in the very beginning of Matthew 24, Jesus begins in verse one. And it says there, as Jesus was leaving the temple grounds, his disciples pointed out to him the various temple buildings. And Jesus responded to them, do you see all these buildings? I tell you the truth, they will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. And church, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. And then we come to verse three. Later, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives. His disciples came to him privately and, his, and they said to him, these are the two questions, the burning questions that they had for Jesus at this moment. The first was this, they said to Jesus privately, tell us, when will all this happen? 
Learning question number one, when will all this happen? And secondly, they said to Jesus or asked of Jesus, what sign will signal your return and the end of the world? Now, it's interesting to note that right after Jesus, uh, right after his disciples asked, asked this of Jesus, Jesus went into a partial explanation of some of the things that would happen, amen. And he gave some words of warning, some words of exhortation, amen. But I want to tell you this about that first question which Jesus asked, tell us when all this will happen. What were they concerned about? They were concerned about knowing the time. Why do you suppose they were concerned about knowing the time? You know, church, I think for us today, that's, that's kind of like us. Well, when? Well, when? Are we there yet? When? Are we there yet? Amen. We are a culture consumed with having to know when and having to know, are we there yet? I can imagine the disciples saying to Jesus, maybe they didn't use these words, but in some fashion, are we there yet? Is it getting ready to happen? When will this happen? Now, we don't get the answer to, we don't get Jesus's answer to that first burning question until verse 36 of that very same chapter. So look with me, if you will, at verse 36 of Matthew 24. And he says this. Remember, after all of that he said, he gave some things. He said, however, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the son himself. Only the father knows. Church, what Jesus was telling his disciples very succinctly. And quite frankly, if Jesus answered in that fashion to me, I would just not ask any more because that would be explanation enough, amen? But Jesus answered his disciples very succinctly, if I may put it so casually, Jesus was telling his disciples, I have no idea. Now, this might have been confusing to his disciples because they knew that Jesus, son of God, amen, was God, and didn't God know everything? But here we have Jesus saying to his disciples, I have no idea. I have no idea. You know, church, what that tells me is this, and we're going to talk about this in just a few minutes. What that tells me is this. First of all, Jesus was living in obedience to the Father. And Jesus was also living as fully man. It was not for Jesus to know. Amen? Jesus was very clear. I don't know. It's not mine to know. It's the Father's to know. The second thing about Jesus' answer tells me this. If you look through Matthew 24 and a little bit also in 25 to follow, Jesus was, Jesus was saying, I have no idea. Perhaps Jesus was letting them know that's not the important thing. Too often, church, we tend to want to focus on the things that not, are not important, and we fail. We fail to grasp the things that, we, that are important or that we should be paying attention to. Amen? So because Jesus answered this way, I'm not going to go into a great big discussion because Jesus left it there right on the table. I don't know. It's not mine to know. It's not mine to know in obedience to the Father. And it's not mine to know because there are, there's something more important that you need to know. Amen? And church, I would dare say, if that was us, if we were so consumed with having to know when, what would our lives be like? We would just be clock watchers and calendar watchers, waiting for that hour, waiting for that day. Amen? Such that we may lose sight of the bigger picture. There was wisdom in Jesus saying, there was wisdom in Jesus' obedience and not knowing, and there was wisdom in Jesus telling them, I have no idea. But Jesus would tell them, amen, church, Jesus would tell them what was important. So the burning question, first of all, was this, when? 
And Jesus answered. The second burning question, church, that probably we all have today, as a matter of fact, uh, Christians throughout the ages have had, and I know we have had because I, I see things on social media. We, we've talked about this before together in different church groups and with various friends and so forth. But the second part of that verse three that, the, that his disciples asked Jesus privately is, what should we look for? Tell us when, tell us what to look for. It is widely accepted theologically that Jesus' answer to this question includes two parts. The destruction or siege of Jerusalem, the temple, and the second advent of Jesus or the end of the world. The burning question is, what should we look for? What are the signs of the times, someone might say? Amen. Now, if you go back, go back to where verse three is and go to verse four, Jesus between verse three and verse 36 begins to tell them some of the things that they were to look for verse by verse. Again, in those verses it contains so much that it would be, we would not give it due justice today, but we will at some point. But as a matter of a point for this, for this message this morning, church, there are different signs that Jesus said will portend his coming. Some of you may have heard these from me before in another study. But look what Jesus has, says here. What does he say? There will be what? False Christs. False doctrine. Amen? You will, they will come in my name. They will claim I'm the Messiah. And what will happen? Deception. What is a sign that will portend false doctrine, false prophets, false teaching, deception? Jesus also said this in verse 6. Follow along with me, if you will. We're still in Matthew 24. There will be wars and rumors of wars. Now, you know, church, I want to just say this about deception, and I want to say this about wars. Those two verses themselves could speak to any time from the time of the apostles to our current age. Amen? Throughout the lifetime of the church, there have been false prophets. Throughout the lifetime of the church, there have been wars and rumors of wars. Why would Jesus leave that so general? But I just want us to note that, that these things have occurred repeatedly already throughout the church age. Can I get an amen? And every time, every time we get some of these things, we begin all this talk about the, prof the prophetic fulfillment. Amen? So there will be false Christ. There will be deception. There will be wars and rumors of wars. Look in verse 7. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. Has the world already, from time to time, already known famine, already known earthquakes and, and weather, turmoils of weather that are unbeknown to places that, that they were not before, amen? Do you get what I'm saying? Some of these things we have already lived through and seen. But it doesn't mean, church, it doesn't necessarily mean that Christ is coming tomorrow. Jesus said these are some of the things, amen? In verses 9 and 10, he says there's going to be persecution. Have Christians already experienced persecution? Amen, yes, and indeed, church. False prophets, again, he mentions in verse 11. Betrayal in verse 10. Many will turn away from me. They will betray and they will hate each other. Family against family, friend against friend. Church, have we already seen that? Amen, church, we see it alive and well today in our culture today. It amazes me. It amazes me the things that divide families these days. And it amazes me the things that divide 50-year-old friendships these days. It amazes me. It amazes me the things that divide church families these days. But we know it. We know it to be true. In verse 12, he said there will be lawlessness. Church, we live in an age today where perhaps we, have, we are witness to more lawlessness than we have ever seen. 
we can only shake our heads and wonder why. Jesus said all of these things would be descriptive of the ends of the time. These are some of the things that you would look for that would portend his second coming. But church, these are the things that we have seen in abundance throughout the church age already. Amen? Jesus said these things would portend his coming. Hallelujah. And lastly, look at verse 14 there. He said this, and the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it and then the end will come. Amen? Worldwide preaching of the gospel. I shared this with the group before. We know that the word of God today is worldwide. But church, as I shared with the group before, there are so many today that are still unreached. There are people groups within, in, within various countries that are still unreached. The gospel still needs to be proclaimed throughout the world. All of these things Jesus said, amen, will portend his coming. And he likened it to what? To birth pains. I've never given birth. But Jesus likened it to birth pains. Amen, church? Now, I'm just going to leave that right there for what Jesus said were some of the signs of the times. And what I want to get into now, what I want to discuss with us now, church, is this. What was important to Jesus? Now, Jesus didn't say not to pay attention to the signs. He most certainly said to pay attention. Otherwise, why would, he, why would he bother to have given them to us? So he gave us the signs. But if you, if you look here in Matthew 24, and a verse in Matthew 25, what was important to Jesus, let's look at Matthew 24, almost to the end of that chapter, verses 42 through 44. And Jesus says here in verses 42 through 44, so you too must keep watch, for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Understand this. If a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. So you also must be ready all the time for the Son of Man will come when least expected. And then in chapter 25, church, in chapter 25, in verse 13, Jesus repeats those words. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or hour of my return. We need to know the signs. But more importantly, Jesus was saying, you need to keep watch. You need to be ready. If you go back right before verses 42 and 40, uh, through 44 and, and chapter 25, 13, Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes, it will be like it was in Noah's day. What was happening in Noah's days? Noah's days? People were not paying attention to the things of the Lord. And God used a drastic measure to wake people up. Amen? A great awakening in the flood. When the Son of Man returns, God's word says, it will be like it was in Noah's days. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered the boat, right up to the time they did not pay attention to the things of God, right up to the time Noah entered the boat. They, they scoffed at Noah. Noah, what you doing? What's that big old thing in your yard, Noah? Amen? And, and then it says in, in 35, People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. 
That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. So Jesus, Jesus most certainly wanted us to be aware of the things to look for. But more importantly, Jesus wanted us to know that it is ours to keep watch and it is ours to be ready. I think most of you know, I've shared this before, I saw a bumper sticker on the car one time and it said, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming soon. Look busy. No, you know, the irony in that. Jesus is coming soon. Look busy. Hallelujah, church. Reception. Jesus is saying here in Matthew 24 and 25, I'm going to be coming. Jesus, when I come back, but he's saying what? Keep watch. Be ready. Pray. Now, what did Jesus mean when he said to keep watch? When you keep a watch on something, you know, your eyes are fixed to keep a watch or to watch over. You observe something with what? With a continual or continuous or constant attention. He talked about the burglar. If I knew a burglar was going to come to the house, I would cert most certainly be vigilant and diligent to make sure that didn't happen or be ready for when that burglar came. Jesus said, just like that, you protect your house like that. Why don't you protect yourself like that? Why don't you keep watch over yourself like that? Hallelujah, church. Jesus said, keep watch. Spiritual watching and praying. Jesus' words to keep watch were a command. He didn't say, I would suggest you keep watch. He didn't say you should keep watch. He didn't say it might be a good idea. Jesus said very emphatically, keep watch. Be ready. Spiritually alert spiritually awake. You know, as I was preparing this, I was recalling a sermon from maybe four years ago, three years ago. And in that sermon, you say, well, what does it mean to be spiritually awake? Well, what does it mean to be sleepy? What does it mean to be spiritually sleepy? Let's look at Isaiah 66 and verse 2. Isaiah 66, church, in verse 2. And as a matter of fact, the, the B part of verse 2. It says there, my hands have made both heaven and earth. They and everything in them are mine. I, the Lord, have spoken. Now look what, look what he says there. Look what the prophet Isaiah says there. And by the way, we know from the beginning of chapter seven, of 66, this is the Lord's word. This is what the Lord says. I will bless those who have humble and contrite hearts, who tremble at my word. In other words, church, he's saying, when you read the word of God, how do you receive the word of God? Are you receiving the word of God? Amen, church. Are you receiving the word of God as it was meant to be received? Are you trembling at the word? When you read the word of God, does it move something inside of you? You know, sleepy Christians, there's a quote that says, they may read their Bibles. Oh, yeah, they do. But not with much excitement. Not with much application. Do you tremble at the word of God? Does it move you? Does it stir you up? Does it convict you? Hallelujah, church. The word of God, does it move you? Disregard the study of God, a theologian writes. And you sentence yourself to stumble and blunder through life blindfolded, as it were, with no sense of direction and no understanding of what surrounds you. 
Are you stumbling through life blindfolded? Or are you trembling at the word of God? Everybody say with me, tremble. 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 The word of God make you tremble. Hallelujah, church. A sleepy Christian reads their Bible without expecting very much, without much enthusiasm, and without much application. Church, it's not enough to read the word. Church, you got to do the word. Amen? Be ye doers and not only hearers. Be ye doers and not only readers. Jesus was saying to them, keep watch. Keep watch over your spiritual selves. And church that starts with the word of God, tremble at his word. Keep watch over his word as though you were protecting your house from someone who would come in and destroy it. Pay attention to your spiritual self, lest the enemy enter in and seek to destroy you. Amen, church? And that's why we have a depression. And that's why we have church. Uh, we have, uh, we get disgusted and distracted and disappointed. Tremble. Keep watch. Be ready. Look with me, if you will, at James 5 and 16. James 5 and 16. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. The Christian who is not spiritually keeping watch, who is sleepy, amen, they may pray. But with not much earnestness. They may pray, but without, not much, without much effectiveness. And church, here, here is the sticking point. They may pray, but not with much expectation. When you pray, are you praying expecting God to do something? And when you pray, are you expecting God to do what God will, even if it's not what you will? Hallelujah, church. Jesus said part of being spiritually awake, keeping watch, being alert, amen, being ready, it's prayer. Stay in the word, stay prayed up. But when you pray, do it with expectation that, Lord, thy will be done and not mine. Oh, this is good stuff, church. Amen. Ephesians 4 and 16. Ephesians 4 and 16. He says there, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. If you missed the Bible study last night, oh, church, you missed a good word. I'm bragging on the Lord, not my own self, because it was all about the word. But church, here is what we know. Here is what we know from last night, that as much as we need Holy Spirit power in our lives, church, we need the body of Christ. Church, look at, look at yourself. Look at the screen and see all of you on that screen. Church, as much as we need the power of the Holy Spirit for this life to keep us alert, to keep us ready. Amen, church. We need the whole body of Christ working together, helping each other grow. So the whole body is healthy. Church, look at the screen again. If any one of you is not healthy, we are not altogether not healthy. The whole body of Christ healthy and growing and full of love. Amen, church? The Christian who is not spiritually alert, keeping watch, those Christians, they may go to church. 
They may join in a Zoom worship, but only as a spectator and only as a consumer, I'm going to watch and I'm going to take in. But they don't come as a properly working part of the body. Here's the key word that contributes. If you are spiritually keeping watch, spiritually alert, amen, church, ready, you are not merely a consumer in the body of Christ. You are not merely a spectator. You're not watching and taking. But church, you are contributing to the growth of the body of Christ, contributing to the kingdom of God. That contribution looks different for each of us. But rest assured, church, we know from Ephesians 4 and 16, the whole body works together so the whole body is healthy and growing and loving each other. And the last thing about a sleepy Christian, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20, church. So we are Christ ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. The believer who is not keeping watch spiritually or alert or ready. Amen. You read the word, but without much excitement or application. You pray, but without much effectiveness or expectation. And you go to church, but without a, making a contribution. But look here, church, what else is it about our faith? What else is it about that Jesus said it to us? Amen, church? If you are spiritually alert, if you're keeping watch, if you are ready, amen, church? then you are excited enough about your faith to present it to others. Because if you are one of these uh, uh, sleepy Christians, if you will, a sleepy Christian may be around non-believers, but they're not excited enough about their own faith to present it to others. Church, we are the carriers of good news. And especially in this age of this pandemic and world unrest and national unrest and family unrest, hallelujah, church. We who are the bearers of good news ought to be excited enough about our faith that we speak it out to those who do not know the wonderful grace of God. Can I get a big amen, church? You know, I can't help but think of Esther. Esther was, in her time, she came for such a time as this. Now, church, it's not desirable that we, we are living in this age of a pandemic and all the other stuff that's going on in this world. That's not desirable for us, right? But church, know this, just as God sent Esther for such a time as this, again, look at the screen. Look at all of you on the screen today. And church, know that each and every one of us, God knew in his sovereignty that in this year of the Lord 2020, that all of us would be around. Why? To be bearers of the good news, to be excited enough about our faith to say, I don't care what's going on in this world. God is still good and faithful. And I have a message of good news. And I'm so excited about it. I can hardly contain myself. Yes, church. That's what was important to Jesus. We need to be spiritually awake, spiritually alert. How do we do that? We stay in the word. We pay attention to our walk. Don't neglect your spiritual disciplines. I know I've said that again and again and again, but church, it bears repeating. Pay attention to your walk. Stay in the word. Pray. You can watch for the signs. Jesus gave us the signs. But don't be caught up in the signs. 
to where they become your idol. And church, what do we know about Jesus? What do we know about spiritually awake and spiritually alert? We ought to be about God's business. In other words, we keep witnessing. We keep doing ministry. We keep proclaiming the wonderful message about the good news of God's amazing grace. Has God's amazing grace touched you? Church, may we take that message to those who know, don't know him. Amen? Because we know that what was important to Jesus was to keep watch, to be ready, and secondly, and lastly, church, I'm going to wind it up. What was important to Jesus was that we be his witness. Everybody say with me, watch. watch. Everybody say watch. Watch. And everybody say witness. Witness. Right? Turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 1. Church, you know what? I'm so excited. I hope that when I get to heaven, there's a spot on the cheerleader team for me. Amen, church? Amen. Acts chapter 1. Look at verse 6. So when, and again, remember, church, we talked about in the beginning, Jesus' ascension also occurred just as the Olivet Discord, Discourse, Jesus' ascension also occurred on the Mount of Olives. In verse 6, it says, when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him. They kept at that, that word, they kept asking. You know, it still troubled their minds. <laughs> all the way, all the way from John, amen, and Matthew and Luke to Acts. It's still troubling their minds. They ask Jesus again, Lord, has the time come? Has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? And Jesus put it to him again, quite frankly, quite plainly, in Jesus' fashion, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But Jesus didn't leave it at that this time. Look at verse 8. He said, oh no, you still do, can't know. It's still only the fathers to know. But there's that little word, and in that word, what follows that little word contains a whole lot of stuff, church. Because what he said after but was this. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Two things, Jesus said. You will receive power, and you will be my witnesses. You know, in the message, in the message translation of these, of these verses, he puts it like this, and I like it because it's very, very clear. It speaks to us in our everyday language. It says this in verse 7 and 8, after the disciples asked the question, is it time? Are we there yet? Jesus told them in 7 and 8, coming from the message translation, Jesus told them this. <laughs> I like Jesus the way he answered his disciples. He said this, you don't get to know the time. You don't get to know the time. Timing is the Father's business. And then what Jesus said, what you'll get is the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes on you, amen, you will be able to be my witnesses. Church, what was Jesus saying in Matthew 24? The time, even I don't know. Here are some of the signs. What I do command you, church, is to pay attention, to keep watch, to pray, to be alert, and to be ready. Amen, church? 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And I promise you I'm done. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, if you will, church. And I'm getting there myself. 
Chapter six, verses one and two. As God's partners, we beg you not to accept this marvelous gift of God's kindness and then ignore it. So Paul is saying, we beg you, we plead with you, we, we ask you, don't accept this marvelous gift of God's grace and then ignore it. Verse two, for God says, at just the right time, I heard you. On the day of salvation, I helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. So church, what does all this mean for us today? We in the church age still need to pay attention. Watch for the signs. But more importantly, church, as Jesus told his disciples then, Jesus tells us today, keep watch, be alert, and be ready. And here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, he says what? right time is now. The right time is now. So the ch church, the challenge for us today, accepting the words of Jesus to keep watch and be ready. The challenge church for us today is what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Amen church? May we give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. All right, I'm going to defer right now to our diaconate team for the Lord's Supper. All right. <clears throat> Good morning, family, church family. We, um, before we take the uh, Lord's Supper's elements, let's, let's open our Bible to 1 Corinthians 11. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, chapter 11, verses 23 to 31. For I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judge or examine ourselves, we would not come under judgments. Church family, let's take a moment to examine ourselves before the Lord. Let us pray. Our great Father, Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for this uh, beautiful Sunday, another opportunity to celebrate you and your Son, Jesus, and Holy Spirit. We thank you for giving us your Son to clean us of our sins, Lord, and bring us back to you. We thank you so much for all what you have done and all the things that you have promised for us to, to, to be, Lord, in your Son. We ask that you open our hearts and minds, Holy Spirit. We ask that you show us any and confess sins, any sins that are lurking there, Lord, help us to see it and have the humility to confess it before you and ask your forgiveness. Lord, help us clean us our mind, our hearts, and everything, Lord, that we could be pleasing to you and will become your witness for the world, especially in these times, Lord, that we you ask us to be watchful and be ready for your coming, but be a witness for everyone. 
And we thank you of all you've done, Jesus, on the cross. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's pray for the, the bread. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for your great, greatness and uh, for all the opportunities that you've given us. I fully understand, Lord, that you are God, the only one. And we thank you for the body that was broken for us. Let's take the bread. Let's pray for the wine. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for your Holy Spirit to always guide us. Thank you, Lord God, for your Son, Jesus Christ, who shed his, his blood to the cross, Lord God, for our sins, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the salvations, for dying us on the cross, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, that you always bless us, Lord Jesus, and forgive, forgive us our sins, always. And we are grateful for our life, Lord Jesus. Thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, for the announcement, just a quick announcement. Um, group three, our older kids, which is the teens, um, we will meet tomorrow night. Tomorrow. And then the group three discipleships this coming Friday at seven o'clock. Um, for the ministers, uh, we're planning to meet on Tuesday, 8.30 p.m., waiting for um, Carl permission that's it thank you cello thank you thank you uh the diaconate team for wonderfully and faithfully uh serving uh, the lord's supper each and every month so church you know today did conclude our sermon series about valleys and mountains and if you want to get a sneak peek into what uh, your pastors will be preaching through the next seven weeks uh, we are starting a new sermon series called I Am Who I Say I Am. And myself and Pastor June and Pastor Marvin, we will be exegeting scripture in the Gospel of St. John as it relates to the seven I Am statements of our Lord Jesus Christ. So church, I pray you get excited. If you want to get a sneak peek, we're going to look next week. I uh, started off with Jesus' uh, saying, I am the bread of life. I am who I say I am. Amen, church? And amen. amen. I'm excited for this upcoming sermon series just as much as the one we just finished through. All right, church, if you would, let us now have our benediction. Now all glory to God, who is able to keep you from falling away. And will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to him who alone is God, our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are his before all time and in the present and beyond all time. And God's people said together, Amen. 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 Hey, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a blessed Sunday, everyone. Nate's birthday is on August 11th. Hi, Jean. Hi, Leah. Thanks.